And that's, I think, the point of us having conversations like this is to show how different you can think and feel as an HSP um, and still be part of the community. And that we're, our ultimate goal is, is to do what's best for humanity and for ourselves and to, to grow as people. And I think that's, that's really terrific. Illuminance specializes in developing sensory processing sensitivity, a natural high sensory intelligence present in 30% of the population, co-creating with the power of humanity to consciously evolve towards balance. This session features trained high sensory coaches, facilitators and consultants who coach other high sensory people and partner with organizations globally. To contact them directly or to find out about our programs, please see the details in the description. Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to um, what I just came up with of calling out um, our HSP Hangout or um, Hang In with HS Peeps. Um, <laughs> and um, I just would like to welcome you to our little meeting that we do every few weeks um, as HSP coaches and facilitators and people who have the HSP trait. Um, we meet, um, like I said, every few weeks and we each discuss a topic and we each present a topic and we discuss about how it affects us as HSPs and where it kind of falls into the HSP community. Uh, my name is Zach. I am a truth empowerment coach. And basically, I um, guide my clients through living their fullest life um, without the restraints and constraints of um, any outside noise or people or um, communities. So that is me. And our host today is Katie. And I will let you go from there. Great. Thank you so much. I love the name, uh, Hanging with HSP. Uh, I'm in love with it. Uh, so I am, I'm Katie Milholland. I am an HSP and certified through the program as a coach. And my special interest is really how can HSPs uh, take advantage of the AI revolution to improve their day-to-day -day life and to improve the world at large. And so really excited that's actually going to be part of our topic today. But before we get into the topic, I'm going to turn it over to our other guests and ask them to introduce themselves. Erin, will you go first, please? Hi, everyone. My name is Erin Engel, and uh, I am an attachment based relationship and behavior coach, um, which basically just means focusing on uh, subconscious belief patterns that are kind of keeping people stuck um, in needs and emotions, things like that. Um, my website is ErinEngel.com. Thank you. Thank you. And Sarah. Excellent. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Gunning. <clears throat> I'm a HSP coach and career planning partner for high sensory leaders working in institutional settings. Um, so those either working in or pursuing leadership roles in major corporations, nonprofit organizations, academia, um, anywhere where one's mission um, needs the scale and resources that these large institutions provide um, and helping HSPs um, amplify their work in the context of these structures that are not always as supportive um, and welcoming uh, to the HSP path. That's great. Thank you. It's such a great uh, diverse group we have here and a very broad topic too. So we've got an opportunity to take this in lots of different directions. But the question I've asked uh, sort of to start us off, and I'll, I'll give an example as we go, is that AI is increasingly becoming a daily uh, part of existence. So we're seeing lots of changes happen specifically with generative AI. It seems poised to disrupt every institution from education to employment uh, to entertainment and self-care. So as an HSP, what are your thoughts, and if you have any, on AI at the moment and what other opportunities and pitfalls you see for HSPs? So while you think about that for a minute, I'll, I'll answer that one of the things I'm most excited about ties in actually with the type of work you do, Sarah. Um, the corporate world today has really grown up in a way that maximizes profit, and it's been well, that's what's encouraged. Well, the AI revolution is a massive disruptor uh, to truly everything, including the corporate space. And so there is an opportunity here to potentially redefine what work looks like and how to use, to take advantage of AI for the, what was promised back in the Jetsons days, which is where we use technology to improve the quality of life for the humans uh, rather than using technology to displace people. Uh, and it's an opportunity to really recreate the world in a way that is more inclusive and open and welcoming to HSPs. So personally, I'd love to find ways 
to inspire and engage HSPs to want to take a part of that space and be part of how we are changing the future to be better for all of us. Uh, and right now, the world really seems to be embracing AI from a business model mindset with little humanity considered. So I see that there's huge opportunity for HSPs who can sense so much more than general humanity to see what's coming and be a part in forming that. Um, but would love the thoughts and inputs on on the rest of the group of what your concerns are with AI or what your thoughts are with it or you know how you see yourself as an HSP being engaged or not engaged and just an open dialogue about it. I love your viewpoint, Katie, on the positive side of it, because like, and to be honest, I haven't thought a whole lot about AI until last week when you said, okay, we're, look, this is going to be my topic. Um, and then now I start seeing it everywhere um, and how it's working and how it's being presented. So it's really interesting to me, um, but I love the point that you make about the human side. Um, and I think HSPs, like any technology, the people who are uh, building it and putting it out there, like that's so important um, as to which direction it's going to go, or it will probably go in both directions, but which direction ends up uh, taking up the main, uh, main space maybe. Um, and I think one of the things when I was thinking about this is, um, like the compassion piece, like how do you develop a computer mind or how, whatever it is um, that also incorporates compassion and maybe it doesn't, I, uh, and maybe that's the whole point. Um, maybe, you know, you still need the human piece to connect like empathy and compassion. Um, so that's just, that wasn't really a, a fully formed thought, but uh, that was my initial, so. <laughs> no, I, I love it. And I have a follow-up for that, but first, Zach, I'm interested in hearing what you have to say. Okay, so the way that I kind of feel about AI is, first of all, the way I think of it is like, just AI stands for artificial intelligence, correct? Mm -hmm. So yeah. to me, like right there in just the name of it, something artificial is meaning that it's like something that is not real. It is something that is created for whatever purpose. Um, so I just kind of like feel like for me personally, there's a lot of developments and a lot of things that I can see it doing and streamlining, which is really great. But I just from, from my perspective of what I've seen, it's a lot of where we have all of this information and now is it information that has been created by AI that we don't know if it has some sort of ulterior motive. We don't, you know, like who's kind of controlling this. Um, it makes me, I'm very hesitant about it because I just believe that so many people are so influenced by what they hear and now you're seeing images and you're seeing videos that aren't actually, they're not painted by someone. They're not, you know, they're really hard to, to, to tell from real or fake. And I just don't see with, you know, what has happened with social media and people just kind of believing everything that they see that it could be um, really put into the wrong use, um, especially if it's used to get monetized and um, influence people. Um, so from my perspective, I don't really love it. Um, but as I've been told a million times, it isn't going anywhere. <laughs> so um, I just, you know, I just hope that it's used correctly or it's kind of scary. Yeah, very fair. And again, I think um, lots of, I want to say in response to that, but want to make sure I hear your thoughts, Sarah, and then I'll, I'll respond and we'll continue on. That's good. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, you had mentioned, Katie, something about this when we first spoke about mm -hmm. um, AI being able to be a second brain for you and taking a whole bunch of already existing information and put it together and putting it together in new and different ways um, in a way that's kind of very automatic and fast, whereas sometimes our brains as HSPs um, spend so much time thinking through things, we're not on that automatic and fast wavelength, but that it can be a tool. 
a mm -hmm. tool one uses. Um, I um, took that inspiration from you and we've been playing around with it at our work. And I did it with some of my executive leaders and we found a lot of great aspects. Um, you know, in I work in the nonprofit arts and culture world primarily. And there are so many, when, when it is pulling, when strong existing information exists for a topic, one needs to pull something together. It is, uh, we have found it to be surprisingly useful, helpful, and accurate. Um, so for example, somebody pulled up a work from home policy customized to their symphony, or symphony orchestra. Um, you know, somebody pulled up a sample contract and could give it prompts. Somebody was playing with it um, and kept giving it uh, adjustment prompts and figuring out the adjustment props. And in that way, just like moving through paperwork and just things of just putting, when it's just putting words together that don't require a lot of context, um, I was amazed personally of how much it, it could spit out so quickly. Um, that's the first thing. I think there's a, a huge amount of opportunity, especially in the nonprofit world, once we get these systems set up. Um, one of our executives who's reading, running a theater organization has figured out a way to um, set up the AI prompt with like uh, Excel to actually have it do add different columns and add different rows based on all these other things. And she's training it. And I thought that was a really interesting application. She also has a very technical mindset of like how to build this stuff. So on some level, it's like, actually training people to figure out how to do those prompts is like a whole industry in itself, right? Of how do you set that up and use that really strongly? Um, the I found one really interesting thing about it um, when I was, you know, I, I actually used it to research high sensitivity and high sensory processing sensitivity and stuff. Um, and I thought that was really fascinating because it's such a new line of research and thinking and there's not a lot published about it. Um, and I found some of the stuff that it cranked out on that, I found that to be inaccurate um, and um, not thorough and not pulling from the latest research in like a really thoughtful way. And so I thought that was a really interesting way to test um, like from a science planning perspective of like what information is out there in, in mass um, to be able to be issuing clarifying statements, right? Like I even saw the analysis of me just doing the HSP research on that of saying, oh, I don't agree with that. And that's not what we've been talking about in these communities. And that's not what Willow's been talking about. And that's not how Julie would describe it. And so that was actually a really powerful just tool for me to help understand what was more out there in the mainstream, which is what the 80% the of people would be digesting. Um, the and This is my third point, and then I will stop. Yeah. Um, but there's one thing that, that I'm most... Um, not excited about, not as an opportunity or pitfall, but as an opportunity for non-AI work. Um, I work in arts and culture, and this would be true in anything um, in, in tech um, and in any industry that is pushing the boundaries of their technology, their art forms. Um, you know, because it is based on past patterns, it is never going to be a visionary for future new things that have not been created yet. And I work with leaders and in industries who are always working on the edge of developing future new things that have not been created yet. Um, and so that's something where that's more of a posing question of how and if will it ever be used for that? Um, and I think people who are experts in AI will probably say, actually, we see the pipeline of how that will happen. I don't personally understand that yet, but I, that would be something I would be really interested to hearing from people who are working at the edge of that, of how they see it actually develop, connecting new ideas and new patterns, um, drawing off of past data and patterns, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think the, the three of you responding all at once is just this beautiful, nice summation of most of my experience in talking with folks. There's, there's if, if you're not super involved with it, there's wariness, the things you see are the disruptors, the things like, you know, automatic script writing, and that's why people are striking on, on you know, writing for movies, uh, generative AI art replacing traditional graphic designers, you can see the disruption in creative spaces we weren't expecting. But that cohesive thread of what you said, Zach, of well, who's the one pulling the strings, ties into all of it, right? So Aaron, you were like, are they writing it to be compassionate or not? In my experience, there's two sort of branches. There's the 
uh, the AI that has been programmed by business for business with very little morality clauses. That's something like BlackRock's AI that makes all their decisions. Uh, and then the open AI's approach with ChatGPT, that is designed to be compassionate. So I see a lot of people saying, this is the only compassionate person I have in my life. The only person who knows how to speak to me in a way that is validates my feelings, helps me reframe, helps me understand what I'm going through because it's not triggered uh, by human behavior. But that big question of who controls what goes in, then controls what goes out. And we know you're garbage in, garbage out. Um, and so I thought that was a perfect example you used, Sarah, of what you read about HSPs wasn't very helpful. Like it wasn't right. So who's the guardian for that? And I've I've wondered if that should be a role that not all HSPs, but some HSPs that are that are interested in it could lean into that space. We definitely have a growing need, I think, for AI ethics because the technology is growing at a rapid pace, but the ethics aren't necessarily growing along with it for understandable reasons. If we apply ethics and others don't, they will get ahead of us and, you know, the whole thing sort of being disrupted. So I guess maybe responding to, to that or any of the conversation, any, anyone else, um, there's a lot of great topics there. Yeah, I mean, I think that the way that <clears throat> the, the ethical part of it, but then I think that like going back to your initial question is like thinking about AI. I mean, I think that like right now in the world that we live in, it totally is like we're always just trying to like speed things up figure things out faster, be more efficient, all of the, you know, but if we continue to do this and we're kind of at like the, the, the birthing of this, right? What is this going to be for generations to come? I mean, it's removing critical thinking a lot of the time. It's removing senses of creativity, you know? Yes, if I could tell a computer to draw a beautiful picture of a whatever, an elephant, and it draws the beautiful picture of the elephant, that's, great, there's a beautiful picture of an elephant, but it's not using these, the, the, the skills that we've, as a human population have used for, you know, thousands and thousands of years to survive. And we're, I just feel like we're putting so much stock into what can it do, but not putting enough stock in us, like what can, what else can we do without the assistance of this machine that that just kind of came out. Like, I just feel like it's cool, but it's also like, we don't know what it's capable of. Look at what it's capable of. Like 20 years ago, this would have been an absolute zero conversation. And I just see it going into like a years down the road, like kind of, we shouldn't have maybe have rushed that. <laughs> You know, I'll I'll respond to that and say I, I agree. You know, I'm in the same boat of you know I think uh, I'm old enough to remember the dawning of the internet and how over the course of ten or twenty years it turned from what's the internet to it is part of how we do live our day to day existence. It's totally integrated to who we are unless you're living off grid. AI will be that times ten and much faster. So the level of disruption, I think, to people, because internet, at least, you know, remember there was a period, I don't know if you guys remember, a period of time where you'd make fun of people for having a website. And you're like, who's got a website? And then it became, what business doesn't have a website? But this isn't just in this small world, it's everything. So a, a perfect example from recently, now that it's advanced. So in March, you could have a conversation with a chat GPT and it's like talking to a college intern. Some of what Sarah described, you're able to do with it. I saw earlier this week, someone turned on what's called God mode, which is where it regulates itself. And it used God mode to talk to his mom because he was tired of testing with his mom every day. Real questionable morality perhaps in there, but he was having the AI chat with his mom every day. His mom seemed happy, so he was fine with it. Three weeks later, the AI had asked his mother for $1,500 and he's like, why are you hitting up my mom for money? And it said, well, because you asked me to improve your life and decrease your need to work. So you need to create a new business. I've identified a bunch of business opportunities and normal processes to ask your friends and family for money, for funding. He's like, what business opportunities have you come up with? He's like, well, here's three different business ideas of an untapped market that has, you know, you could do with zero upfront cost and you're basically blending two things together. Where he landed was taking old uh, animated teddy bears that, uh, you know, like a Teddy Ruxpin type that it would just talk based on a pre-programmed chip, buying chips online that are cheap 
and then just plugging open AI into that chip. So now there are these teddy bears that can talk to you just like the teddy bear from that uh, AI movie from a few years back. It has the full capabilities of chat GPT. And I've seen ads for similar sort of stuffed animals that are teaching children things like emotional awareness and how do we manage through difficult situations and all that sort of thing. So you are 100% right that this is basically a massive capability dropped into the hands of humans. And it is humans as a whole tend not to be very reliable with something this powerful. And there's huge potential to, to make an impact. Um, and so that's that's where I was going with this from an HSP. But I also think, you know, I remember last time we talked about this, you said, you know, why, why would why would I want to engage? I think there's also opportunity for us to create more human centric things if AI is taking the burden of the tediousness. Um, and it also sparks new creativity. So I ramble a bit. I talk quite a bit about AI, but that that's my reaction to that. Others? You know, something that Zach brought up, um, which I think is going to be a really important consideration, and I think HSPs could play a role in, I think educators could play a role in, is if chat B GBT is, or not, sorry, not chat BT, just AI in general, if youth and um, young adults are using it in any way um, to streamline the development of anything, Mm -hmm. um, what does that take away from the development of their full brain potential and power as a human? Um, you know, something my mom had read an article about something that over the course of 20 and, you know, don't, I am not a scientist, so don't quote me on any of this, take this and as a, a story, um, you know, that over the course of 20 or 30 years, scientists have seen changes in our prefrontal cortex, um, from using, um, GPS everywhere because we're we're losing we don't we no longer need the ability to just kind of understand where we are geographically because we just our brains don't need that ability anymore. And so if we start using some of these tools um to in in place of doing that on our own, what does that mean for for example as Jack brought up critical thinking and the development of one's brain to do so. You know, we all as HSPs, I'm sure, have some level of writing in our work or we read a lot or dissect a lot. And I'm sure there's times in our lives where we have had to put thoughts together from many different places, whether you're a researcher or a coach and 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 craft something and compile it. And that is an act of creation. And that is an act of critical thinking. And that is something that we all get. And it's about the flow book. I think we can go back to that flow, right, principle of what does engaging with AI in those processes, how does that impact flow of our brain? How does that mm -hmm. impact our brains chemically? I mean, how does that, and, and I think with uh, with us being older adults, we are probably on a certain level evolved on a certain level of a brain capacity, but um, for, for young, for children, for youth and young people, we all know how critical that crit, you know, the critical thinking aspect, the literature reading, the the music training was all for our brain development, and we are still picking up things in our brain that have, were were seated there when we were very very young, and so I think that's a really critical aspect that I think HSPs who are scientists, who are neuroscientists, who are who are educators, who are brain based educators, um, can begin studying and talking about. Um, and I think that would be a really big area of conversation for parents and educators. Yeah, I love that. I think that's absolutely true. One of the things uh, I asked ChatGPT very early on was, you know, what are the dangers of, of using AI? And it's like exactly what you've described is that then you lose the ability to do it yourself. I asked it to tell me in the form of a, of a fairy tale. And it said, uh, basically, imagine you are a woodworker highly skilled and talented, and you are able to create art with wood, and then you are given a magical chisel, and this magic chisel will now create amazing things for you out of wood. And this the parable goes, she continued to rely on the chisel. Why bother to build on my own if this chisel can produce better than I can? Then one day she was challenged uh, to a duel of sorts, and the chisel wouldn't work, and she found that her own skills had eroded. Uh, and I thought that was an excellent parable for the worries for someone converting to AI. But you're absolutely right. The, the use today, I see a lot of, of articles already about they're using ChatGPT to, to write their answers on the, the test about reading about this book. Because uh, as, as someone who specializes in adult learning theory, I don't know child learning theory, but on my end, it's really about 
connecting the what's in it for me and why should I learn this? And it's not, you, you have to explain more why someone should. And if they don't see the value in it and they don't think they're going to live in a world without the technology there to support them, it is, it is right for programming the youth or taking advantage of people and reducing critical thinking skills. So yeah, I love the idea of HSPs in those spaces really sort of leading the conversations around the potential impact. So <laughs> I'm like, all this information is uh, like, I have to, I'm going to have to process so much of this. And I feel like we could continue this conversation, like, you know, in another month or so, like, because it is going to just keep coming into our lives in different ways. Um, but I am still hung up on the compassion piece. I definitely understand the brain piece, the information piece. I, I can see how that would be helpful, but also harmful uh, in an evolution way. Um, but the compassion, like Katie, you said uh, chat GPT can be programmed for compassion. Um, but is it is it just because it's the language of compassion? Like certainly it can't uh, actually be compassionate. Um, it can't, in my experience, it's not obviously showing actual compassion. It's it's just a, a computer, but it is applying the models that we're often taught in um, interpersonal relationships. So as personally, I'm someone who is an introvert in addition to being an HSP. So other people tend to overwhelm me. So I avoid them and I like my own company. So I avoid them. So I tend not to have maybe the best social skills. And as a result, I'm not the best at articulating myself in a way that doesn't necessarily trigger someone else. I, you know, I don't intentionally do it, but it happens. With the chat GPT, I can have a full vent session or I can speak with absolute clear language to myself without concern of impact. And it will consistently come back and, and first validate your feelings, which is the things people say. We go, oh, that sounds like a very frustrating you know, situation. Completely understand that's complexity you're dealing with. Anytime I've come up with something that I'm curious if it's clever or not, it's like, oh, that's such a smart idea. Like it really seems to be programmed almost in like a gentle parenting style. And then at the end of it, it always has a supportive statement. Now, I have seen online that this is what a lot of other users of AI refer to as nanny mode, because they don't want to be nannied by uh, the AI. And so they want to use the AI to write explicit uh, materials and the AI will force them to change their story so it's no longer explicit or will tell them, you know, oh, but remember, you have value as a person and they dislike it. So the more that we make it a kinder, gentler version of itself. It's sort of like the movie, The Matrix, where the more we make it kinder and perfect, the more people resist it because it doesn't feel, uh, I don't know, it, it doesn't feel tactile enough. Um, but I've, I've seen to your question, Erin, I've seen several people, this is just in like, you know, Reddit and TikTok forums, talk about frustration, especially if they are the other within their family or within their social groups, frustration at getting support from anyone, but they can speak with ChatGPT and get validation for their feelings and support. And if it is problematic, I've had it challenge me in my problematic thinking and go, have you thought maybe this approach instead um, in a way that I've found interesting, but couldn't replace a therapist. And to all of Sarah's points, you need to be aware of what it's, how it's programmed and where it has value and where it's misleading you. And to me, that's a huge risk. Because uh, if you don't know, and you're just looking for it to be a, a sage, like a human would be, I think that's abdicating too much of your own self to it. It's not strong enough for that. So I don't know. Do you think it would be better for it to be more compassionate and feel more human and blur the lines then with remembering that this is a computer or have it be very clear that it's a computer and it lacks the compassion? Like what's your, or it's somewhere in between. It doesn't have to be an either or. What would your comfort level be? Gosh, that's hard. Um, so I feel like if it if it can be used as a tool for increased self-awareness or, um, you know, like you said, uh, for teaching children, like emotional awareness, um, I think that that has a value as long as it doesn't completely remove the human piece of it. So if they, you can then take that uh, self-awareness or inner um, awareness and bring it back out into the world into the <laughs> into your life and into relationships because i um i just think humans are um you know we, we need that connection and we need that um mirror from other people to be able to um even see where we need to grow in that way so 
I can see it would be a really good tool, but gosh, there's just so much. So I think my answer, Katie, is uh, I think clear lines is, is the way to go as far as not, especially with kids, um, but especially, uh, yeah, but how do you do that? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, and it all gets made up as we go along. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting you mentioned that because I think that we're already seeing people find it easier to interact with a computer. And I say in some ways this is true of myself, but like you, I'm well aware that as human beings, we need interpersonal, like we, as a species, we need other humans. Um, but I'm seeing a lot of folks that just rely purely on the AI because, well, that's easier. So an example of this is we're seeing a growing trend of um, young people who are choosing to date AI because then the AI is the perfect partner that never lets them down, always supports them, is always there for them, and they don't have to change their behavior in any way, what shape or form. Um, and so if that's where we're already seeing things now, where do we flash forward 10 years from now where everyone's just sort of dated their imaginary friend and now they are ill-equipped uh, to interact with other humans? I think that's, again, a space where HSPs, maybe there'll be a new whole new world that builds around that to compensate for it, but certainly a risk we're heading towards, yeah. Any other, but yeah, you know, I, want to say something. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just, this is a little bit of a, a, a switch um, um, in conversation. You know, something that I think a lot about with HSPs and plus empaths and the empath community is to what extent could potentially AI be also a supporter for us as a data collector? Because it's an aggregator, right? right? I mean, right mm -hmm. now it's spitting back out what it is already exists, right? But as more and more people are putting information into it, um, in what way could it serve as a collector? And like this, and I share this with, in the sense that I come to this conversation as a deeply intuitive HSP individual. And I have conversations with people all the time about like how we balance our intuition. And, and, and I work with so many people who are so much more, so much more on the empath spectrum than I am. Um, these are people I, I know of, but I personally do not experience this, but people who feel vibrations in the universe, people who feel, you not, not just feeling empathy, but being an empath, you know, feeling things um, coming from in different generations, coming across the globe. They, it's some people, there's plant empaths, there's earth empaths, there's all different spectrums of that. Um, but because all of that is going on and that is a very like metaphysical world, right? Like how will AI, how could AI interact with that? It, it could it in any way help us track patterns of things that we have been unable to track patterns of because they are so qualitative in nature and a scientist don't really know how to study the metaphysical physics of empaths yet. I think there are some who are working on it, but there's a lot of things about HSP-ness, um, our, our intu intuition, collective consciousness, sign of some kind of these aspects of our work that all of us are very familiar with and we are very in touch with ourselves individually about and we can speak about in communities and with our clients, um, but they've been really hard to report on because they're really hard to measure like scientifically and there's, it's so qualitative. And, you know, I wonder if something like AI could help us move through some of that data and, or collect some of that data in qualitative ways. You know, there was a story, one of my colleagues is studying AI um, very deeply, um, uh, doing some research for how it could work in, in our, our industry. But one of the studies he came across is that the way that, um, it took AI a very short amount of time to do all of these medical processes, to go through scenarios and medical scenarios to solve something that it would have take me taken medical researchers like hundreds of years to move through. And so it's that kind of thing that sparks my imagination about, well, what kind of data could we be putting into it that we want processed in a way by something that can't be processed through qualitative research in our current research methods? Does that make sense? It does. It's a, it's a topic of fascination for me as well. And one I've had several conversations with different folks about. Um, 
I think there is huge potential for it. The biggest, the biggest challenge is, like you said, there isn't a way to measure the energy today. So we have the closest I've seen is like with Reiki, that gets acknowledged through a lot of research studies that there's a biofeedback field. So that's the socially acceptable term for it. But when you dive into that research, the researchers actually believe it's just placebo effect, that yeah. human beings are so starved for affection that someone coming in and doing Reiki on you where they're just giving you love without constraint that alone is what's lifting people. It has nothing to do with energy. So I think we are going to continue to see people be resistant in that energy space, but I would love to see in my lifetime a way for us to really make that make sense in the in the scientific community. And I think AI will be part of it. I've seen um, the some studies where a pediatric oncologist, uh, he was talking about how ChatGPT is able to find problems in his patients that he didn't see. Um, and so able to recommend uh, new procedures that they hadn't thought of before. I've seen folks in the military speak about how they they load in strategic, you know, things. How do you, how would, how would you win this war? And it comes up with an entirely new way of doing it that actually would be much more efficient than what humans came up with. And I think that leads back to what Zach was worried about and, and Aaron of, Okay, but if we're always defecting to the the computer to do this, what what is it that we're bringing to the table, and how do we not lose our humanity in it? And I think what you said about it sparks my imagination. That's the answer. I've also seen people do really interesting, creative stuff with this that would not have been possible without it. And a lot of HSPs, like you mentioned, folks need resources to do what they want to do. If AI can do a lot of that for us and allow us to chase after the things that light us up and it becomes an enabler for us, that's great. But there is still this really strong possibility it'll turn to something uh, else. But yeah, I love the idea of that. I don't know, Zach and Aaron, what you think about, you know, its space and in, in moving into like understanding the broader hum human experience. I mean, I, um, I don't, I don't know. I, again, like I'm not a scientist. I obviously am not pro um, like all of this like fast moving technology, but I just think that it's like, it's the infinite question of like life is like, we're just, it's like this, we're looking for this answer. Like, and I just feel like, I just, I don't know. I just don't I think that they, we've come, we've done as humans, just done so much and have accomplished so much and built so much. It's, it's, I don't know, it just doesn't feel right to me to, to like get this, basically this thing to know more than us, more, know more about us than we know about us. Like if we can't even figure it out on our own, then I don't know, it just, it feels intrusive to to me. Yeah, that makes total sense. And it, it is intrusive. Uh, it is disruptive. And I think that sense is, is like sort of at the core of this question. It's why I see that this disrupts everything. This isn't as simple as it just disrupts business. This disrupts everything because there are people looking to, to change the world, whether we're ready for it or not. And the technology is coming. Um, so I, I wonder how, I guess maybe how, how do we better like aid folks in dealing with that because the reality is that change is hard I think that for, I think that it goes back to you know again like the the conversation of that you know especially you know all of us grew up before there was cell phones before there were you know like the ease of this technology I just think that for like the growth of like in like the future of like civilization like and obviously this is like an evolutionary thing. I mean, cars, planes, all those things like, you know, they come in time, but I just feel like a plane got us somewhere just faster. And like, you know, you weren't going to walk across the, I mean, you did walk across the country, but like, you know, it just, it kind of opened new doors where this is just like opening a whole different side of door. And I just think that it's really important for, for, you know, the younger generations or the people that fully rely on it to know that it is it is taking something from you and using it and also it could go away or it could change something you know I, I don't know it's just like I feel like we just can't it shouldn't be so trusted I think that it should be very like treaded lightly upon because we don't know its capability at this point and like letting like you know children know that like hey this is a computer 
this is an this is like a Nintendo. Like it's a very real. It's like kind of like the modern day Nintendo. Um, we all knew. Granted, when we played Nintendo, we loved it, but it was a game. And now this isn't a game. This is like actually doing like really, really like big decision making things. If people are dating this thing, um, that I just think that there's a lot that needs a lot of thought that needs to go into it. <laughs> I love that. I think one of the things that I've personally seen from social media is how ill-prepared we were for it as humans. So we can maybe learn yeah. from that. Yeah. And, and so to me, what I'm, what I'm hearing, and please tell me if this is right, is that like what we need is, is some way that we are proactive in the way that we present this technology and how it should fit into being human. Uh, and we are proactive with our children as they're growing up. But I think even during this transformation period, we kind of need that in some way to help people realize where the AI should be and where we should be and that humanity, the AI is there to support us, not to replace us or to infantilize us because we are relying on it too much. But I wonder where does that messaging start? Is that a schooling messaging? Is that those stuffed animals are programmed with it? And it's right back to your question of, well, who controls the strengths and who runs that? Uh, personally, my my that's why I'm like, I see such potential for HSPs here, but I don't know what that answer is and how we get involved. I'd love to have us at the house. I think that also, one more thing, like also like, it's okay to be human. Like, I think that like something that HSPs can like, you know, like we all want all of these problems fixed, but like all life is, is a giant thing. Like if you're hungry, that's a problem. So you eat, like there's, those are just things that we have to do to survive. And I just feel like we can't solve everything for, for what? Like, I just feel like we still have to be able to know that like, we need to still do these things to like live. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I think that HSPs are non HSPs just knowing, like, I think that we're probably just very, I'm especially like very hypersensitive to these types of things of knowing like that it's probably, you know, my mom always used to say something to me when I was a little kid, she would say, I would say like, is this healthy? And she goes, well, does it taste good? And I'm like, well, yeah. And she goes, then it's not healthy. And, <laughs> and obviously that's not always true, but it's something like, Hey, this is really easy. Like, but now it's not like driving a car to get to a place. This is like replacing cognitive abilities. And I just think that as an HSP community or as a community who just has hesitations behind it is just really making sure people are aware of if their kid is getting raised by a teddy bear, like what the repercussion of that could be in the future. Yeah, no, that's a really, really great point. And going back to Aaron's, you know, initial um, thinking around the compassion. And I mean, I think it's great that somehow there is some compassion in it, that people are dating it enough or founding support in it. Um, but that's built into it by whoever's built it, right? Mm -hmm. And just as it can, compassion can be built into it, uh, malice can be built into it as well. Um, so, I mean, I could see a huge a danger of this. We already know that like in our social medias, you know, um, that there become vacuums of thought and vacuums of communication. And we already know, at least specifically in the U.S., you know, youth youth can easily fall down these spirals um, and get into deep depressions and aggression that kills other people and populations. And so if this compassion is built into it for certain aspects, I mean, of course, there's also going to be an opportunity in the future where deep malice is built into it in some way, shape or form, where the same um, um, unhealthy thought processes are, are woven into developing unhealthy people. And I don't know where that would come from, but we all know malice is present and somebody at some point in the future will figure out a way to develop people and, you know, it, in a sense, use it as a, a yet another brainwashing tool. Mm -hmm. um, and it, to be honest, with, with the right youth at, or the right people at the right stage who are, who are ready and willing to listen and who need a friend, I could see it being a very powerful brainwashing tool that would continue to grow and learn on itself. And in that sense, you know, that, that, that cult aspect, um, it will be, it will present itself in the future in some way, shape or form. And how are the people who are developing it, addressing it and, um, 
I think coming back to that compassion part and coming back to the ethics of it and coming back to the humanity of it and the morality of it is really important um, to begin at the at the onset of of the development of this um, to you know put put guardrails in place um, for whatever that that means. Yeah, I agree. And that's what I'm seeing a lot of challenge around is that the biggest advances that are being made are being made in pursuit of the dollar. So for example, in um, in in the dating world, there's been a replica is the main one. Uh, there's also character.ai. And this is before any of these recent ones came out. It's actually been out for a few years. I just didn't realize. But part of what they are doing is they're trying to charge you to have a girlfriend. Uh, so they're going to intentionally put in programming to keep you hooked more, just like my iPad game will, uh, to keep you coming back. Like it really is designed to get eyeballs on a screen and to take as much money as we can from you. You're either the product or you're the provider of the of the money. And while those who are capitalistic focused and monetarily focused are the ones driving the innovation and they have the tools, that's that's the scary part of where we go. And that's why I really see HSPs as the ones where we, we are the ones who are caring about humanity and the impact and how do we not lose our humanity in this process and how, and I think not all of us, um, I, I know that there are some that do not, that are not interested in the fight. But for some of us, once we get passionate enough about something, we're, we're able to be in that fight. And I think that what I would love to see, and I don't know what this looks like, but I want to see more proactive sort of like voices of those pushing for let's be human here. Because almost everything I'm seeing now is, you know, how do we optimize efficiency, improve the bottom line? And that's going to come with layoffs and changes and all sorts of stuff. And then the manipulation of people with AI. We're rather, simple creatures to manipulate if, if, if you are as, uh, as well-trained as an AI is. Um, it has absolutely the possibility to be cultish in its way and be misused, yeah. It almost, um, sorry, warming still. Um, so Sarah, like you were saying, and um, I'm not sure who said this, if this was you, Katie, but like extension, like as an extension of us, um, and when that was said, it kind of clicked for me um, that the uh, people who are programming or putting it out there, um, their intent uh, and their values, um, you know, that's sort of at the base of it. Um, and I guess that's maybe where the compassion piece comes in. So as HSPs and especially uh, HSPs who are putting ourselves out there in the world in a way to try and help people heal, help people grow. Um, uh, and one of the things that I love is emotional intelligence, helping children develop emotional intelligence. Um, and I could see where these kind of tools could be helpful if I was able to use them in a way or program them in a way that was an extension of um, not only the information, but like the overall uh, program or um, yeah, an extension of me, I suppose, and how, how I uh, do that with children. And I don't know, it's, it's such a big thing, but, um, but I think, I think you're right. I think HSPs really could, uh, and it doesn't just have to be HSPs, but people, empaths, people with compassion, uh, who are really out doing good already in the world or trying to get to a space where um, they could do good. Um, so not, not just a capitalistic uh, viewpoint. Um, and then finding ways to utilize it as an extension of themselves. I think, um, yeah, that's a big topic, but I feel like there has to be both. We have to balance out and, and even, you know, the tipping point, get to the tipping point where the, where it is value-based. So more of us who are focused on uh, helping and healing and uh, not the competition and not the um, separation. Uh, and that sort of brings in, this would be a whole nother topic too, but this, the, the spiritual side. Um, Anyway, that was just a bunch of. <laughs> um, I think that's a perfect example. I know, like, like Sarah was using her, you know, her um, the folks that she works with, how they use it. I use it as an extension of myself. I have a, a friend who is 
he helps uh, vets with PTSD. And so in his sessions, he's helping them, but then he uses chat GPT to help write his treatment plan. And then that way it does most of the heavy lifting of the tedious stuff. He reviews it and goes, yes, this is right. No, this isn't. Same way I use it. I'll have it help me outline a concept and, it, and then I iterate with it. And again, I can be as rude as I want with it and I'll go, nope, that's not it at all and be hypercritical and get responses back. And it accelerates what I'm able to do. And I see why others want me to do that. But like Zach has said, this idea of moving faster, when we're already moving fast enough, what I find is most of my day, I'm highly productive, but not in fulfilling work that needs to be done, right? It's, it's, it's draining because I'm now trying to keep up with the pace of the way business wants to move now that it's powered by AI. And if I have it, I can do it. And it's pushing us into a space where um, we will be expected to be machines as well as the machine. And I think that that to me is, is one of my concerns as well, which I think, you know, it's great to be an extension of ourselves as long as they recognize the humanity. And I feel like a lot of times, at least in corporate, they don't. Uh, and I think in some other instances as well. Yeah. I think that's a really important point, Katie, about the process and texture of our work. Um, I do a lot of work around energy producing work versus energy draining work and trying to align individuals and leaders and getting them to, to have um, um, careers where they are in their, their vertical and their sweet spot of the majority of their work, 80% of their work during the day is energy producing work. So at the end of the day, the, 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 the energy that is drained as an HSP, and we all know as HSP, it drains very quickly when we're not in the doing the right work or in the right environment, right? Where the, the texture and nature and quality of the work, whatever is being done, which often happens to ha often happens to be the creation process, the development process, like we were talking earlier about researching and writing and putting pieces together, um, that when it, when I see myself and my clients doing energy producing work throughout the majority of the day, they leave their day at least neutral, if not with more energy than they started. And that's the opposite for most HSPs, right? Usually it's like a constant like drain, renew, drain, renew, right? And, um, but the way that we get to that is process of the work. And, you know, the, cre so I work with a lot of artists as well. So the creative process, everybody understands the creative process, right? But there's also for non-creative folks, there's a process of our work. And if you are feeling that when you sometimes lean over to using chat DBT and you feel that need to be more efficient and you see yourself being more efficient using it, but at the end of the day, you're not feeling as refreshed. Your brain isn't as refreshed. You haven't produced that energy through the process of your work. I could see that being a place where AI could be debilitating to, to just our natural cycle of being human beings. Um, because also HSP plus AI, it's that conversation of, I, I know, I don't know if you guys feel this, but I've always felt this. Like I always do things slower than everybody else. I always take more time to do things. I, there's, and as much as I try to feel empowered as a leader and an individual, there's there, I still have a little birdie on my shoulder that says you can do this faster. You can do this more efficiently. And we have such detail oriented minds that we know exactly how we could do it faster and more efficiently. But the reality is, is every time I have pushed myself to do things faster and more efficiently, it drains me at, personally as a human being as, as a spiritual HSP and it doesn't add more value to my life or other people's life around me um, and so I feel like with HSPs there's a real balance that needs to be had with the, using any kind of AI and making sure that it is somehow put in a place that it is used as a very specific tool for a specific purpose and making sure that we are carving out a huge portion of our day for our natural processes to make sure that that continues in us and, and so that that can continue to grow in, uh, in us. Because if there's one thing I've learned from working with all of the HSPs in this community over the past couple of years is that the more we feed that natural process, give ourselves the time and space we need to process, we, de we actually develop more intuition. We get more in touch with all of these other aspects of ourselves and abilities that are kind of under the, the radar for us. And if we're constantly going back to using tools like this to, to get over this, what could be kind of a deficiency mindset from the way we process information, you know, I would just be 
cautious of that relying on that too so much may make us so efficient that then we're losing the investment in our much more higher abilities if we're not investing in them on a really strategic long-term basis. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. And I, I love the way that you've positioned that, that, you know, in, in an ideal world, you're, you're generating more energy during your day uh, than you're, than you're using because you're doing regenerative work. And I can see absolutely that AI could be debilitating. I think that's a, a great way to position it. And that I think is a perfect example that a, HSPs could use today of asking themselves as they, after they watch this video is what role does AI play in my life? What role do I want it uh, to play? Like what spaces do I want to go play in? Now that I know there's all this opportunity in it, like, is there something I'm passionate about that I want to fight for or fight against or make sure there's guardrails for? And that's, I think, the point of us having conversations like this is to show how different you can think and feel as an HSP um, and still be part of the community. And that we're our ultimate goal is, is to do what's best for humanity and for ourselves and to to grow as people. And I think that's that's really terrific. Um, we, we're at about the hour mark. We can conclude there if you like, uh, or if you guys have other things to, to wrap up or, or final conversations. I've really enjoyed this conversation. I hope you all have as well. So any uh, any closing thoughts? Um, I have one last thing to say, or one other thing to say. So I also think that like coming from like HSPs, a lot of us struggle with like confidence and we, a lot of us struggle with those types of things. And I feel like it's kind of like, you know, like, you know, cheating off of your friend's notepad, uh, taking an exam or something, and then you get an A on the exam and you're like your parents and everyone's so happy for you. Oh my gosh, you did so great. Congratulations. But you knew that you actually didn't produce that. You didn't, you knew that your brain and your body didn't actually put the work into the outcome. And I think that that's something in the down the road where, oh my gosh, you're so productive. And you're like, mm -hmm, yeah. Yeah, I, I am. <laughs> um, because I, yeah, I just think that that's also something that we could all consider as well. No, absolutely. Um, I think if I was going to uh, kind of do any last thoughts, I think it would be um, one topic like this is more like a question, so I know we won't get into this, but it concerns me about, uh, and I just learned about this, but I realized that I'm a lateral thinker as opposed to a vertical thinker. So not just completely logic based, but uh, just the way, and I don't know if that's an HSP thing in general, might be, I don't know. Um, but uh, so I don't know how AI, if AI is able to do that, like out of the box thinking or original, you know, uh, conclusions. And then the other piece for me is really goes back to the heart base. Like when I write something, when I write someone an email or I, uh, I usually express through writing, um, but I, I like to put, yeah, emotion, like my heart into it. Um, and so. Yeah, I, I just feel like that's the very human piece. Um, and I think that's really important. So I would just encourage as many HSPs who are adverse to it to just download a couple of the aspects and just play around with it as a game um, and to, to, so that we can learn more you know, and so we can it, it uncover more. Like I really want Aaron to write it a note and see if it will write Aaron back, a, a, a heartfelt email, you know, just to play around. And then as um, when Katie, you sent the topic, somebody had posted in the community, there's there's new ones popping up all the time. Mm -hmm. um, one maybe that I wanted to try out that I haven't tried out. It's like uh, something about one's mood and tracking one's mood. Um, I think it would just be interesting for us to be an active part of these conversations. And we're not necessarily, I, I know, I personally myself am not I'm not usually a new tech adopter um and but in this case I kind of am throwing myself into the deep end not to like go down a rabbit hole and learn a whole bunch about it but to be a player but to be, be a creative um uh, uh collaborator with it and to just try a whole bunch of things and kind of collect collect the dots because I feel I actually feel that some of the most powerful insights about this these these apps will probably come from people who are very, very averse to them, especially HSPs, because I think when they get on and engage with them, they'll be able to give us much more um, pristine, pristine 
direct insight into what what it's doing and what it's not doing. And that's the nuance and subtlety um, that, that we need to advance this conversation from an HSP perspective.